So we've, this is the seventh part of Church, Are We On Track? Doing lessons on chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation, where Jesus address, addresses these churches. Um, this is a fun one. Uh, it's interesting looking across the church about what God, uh, what Jesus is valuing in church life. Uh, it, it, it creates a nice, neat little package when you study the churches and what Jesus is looking for to be able to highlight what he loves and what he doesn't love quite, quite clearly and openly. Um, unfortunately for the church of Laodicea, it is the only church out of the seven that Jesus does not commend them for anything. He's the only one who is not forthcoming in anything good that they're doing or being like. So this will be a fun one to preach today, won't it? Okay? So the church in Laodicea. The church in, uh, of Laodicea. Yeah, I've already said that. So they're the only one without any positive affirmation. There's no mention of any... There's not even any mention of any radical sin or crazy dark sin. What was the most repulsive about them to Jesus was their half-heartedness or lukewarmness. Laodicea... Uh, in Greek, if you could break it up, was named after someone, Laos, Laodike. And Laos means people, and dike means decision. So you can surmise from that that it's a people who made their own decisions. They were an incredibly wealthy city and a self dependent city. And when an earthquake destroyed it decades after this was written, they refused financial aid from Rome but used their own wealth to rebuild it, which is interesting. You'd think you'd want to save as much money as you could. But they were self-reliant, wealthy, uh, they had their pride, they weren't going to receive any funding from Rome. I don't know if it was like it is today, but when you receive funding from someone, you create a tie to them, and there's a, there's a, a, a lording over you when you receive money from people or something. That can happen. Um, especially with government and, and um, when Rome had its intention. Anyway, the city was famous for three things. One, the wealth. It had a lot of banking centres. Um, it was a centre for trade and communication. People used to come there uh, to do lots of trade, lots of communication. It was a meeting place and they had lots of banking centres. They also produced uh, a soft black wool that produced a lot of income for them um, and was quite fashionable to wear over in Laodicea. You were in the crowd if you were wearing these beautiful uh, black woolen soft garments. They also uh, produced uh, eye salve. They had a medical centre there that was people learned about medicine and one of the things that they were most famous for that came out of there was uh, eye, eye salve or this special cream that was uh, used to treat medical conditions for the eye. Um, the one contrast was, and the one major weakness in the city, was that it had no adequate water supply. <laughs> That's a bit of a bummer. Uh, water's pretty important <laughs> for our survival. So it had its water pumped from two places, uh, nearby Colossae from a hot spring. So it came in the pipes hot and came out Lukewarm. <laughs> the second place it came from was uh, Hierapolis. It came from a source where the water was cold, and by the time it got through all the pipes, it came out to Laodicea, lukewarm. And the water that came from the hot springs apparently, um, uh, it, uh, I can't remember the word, it, it, it created some kind of sulfuric sulfur in the mix of it and it was just a bit smelly and like ugh. So it wasn't just lukewarm, it was not good and at the time people would comment about how disgusting the water was in Laodicea. So it had everything going for it apart from its water supply. Okay, let's look at the scriptures from verse 14. All those things are important context because Jesus is communicating to a people um, with this background, and you'll see why these things are important soon. So to the angel of the church in Laodicea, the angel being the messenger to the church. And we talk about angelic beings being a messenger from God to us. But we as people can be angels in the sense of being a messenger 
to people. These are the words of the Amen. Amen, literally meaning, so be it. Have you ever had a time when you speak to someone and then they're like, they say a statement and it's like, full stop. So be it, that's it. The statement is it, it's rock solid. It's not casual talk, these are firm words, solid words that are going to happen. The faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, is faithful, is true, is the ruler of the creation. It's, Jesus is one of great authority, a timeless God. I know your deeds, <laughs> so he knows. That you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Exclamation mark it's got here. So he really does that. Not only has he said his, the words of the Amen. He says I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm. Neither hot nor cold. I'm about to spit or more accurately translated, spew or vomit you out of my mouth. So it's not just a taste in the mouth and a spit. It's a consuming and an unsettling the stomach and then a vomiting. I mean, that's not a beautiful picture, is it? Who uh, enjoys vomiting or watching vomit or cleaning up vomit when your kids are vomited? Especially on holidays, it's just so great. Uh, but it's not a nice experience. What comes out is, is disgusting. Something that's not going on there. I'm, I am about to. So this is, this is the words of Jesus. I'm trying to process what you're all about. But I just cannot keep it down. It's going to come up. I'm tr I have even. I'm trying to swallow it. You know, these people had a shallow form of Christianity. Yeah. As we have, and we have aspects of Christianity in our culture, our Western culture, that is vomit worthy. You know, every week it seems like I'm talking to a couple that's breaking up in our society. Not in this church, <laughs> but just in my out and about by going to soccer training and to soccer games and this, that, and I don't know, I must have a target on my head. Suddenly people pouring out their hearts about their, their recent marriage breakup. <laughs> Yet we have so many weddings that are performed in churches and under ministers. Yet I don't think the intention is always to have God as a pillar and a centrepiece of our marriages. You know, I was talking to one lady some time back, and I think I might have mentioned this before. And, you know, Brooke and I have gone through a hard time with health and holding on, and things are a lot better now, praise the Lord. And um, she just, you know, broken up with her husband, and she goes, Oh, well, you've gone through a lot. You guys are strong. And I'm thinking, I'm not strong at all. I'm thinking, I was just in shock just hearing about it, actually. I'm thinking, I'm not just married to Brooke. This is a commitment I've made with God. And if I didn't have that rock solid commitment I have with God, then my connection with Brooke would be a whole lot looser. If it was just, it's a three way tie. I made that commitment before God. He is a central pillar in our marriage, and He's actually the strongest bit of our marriage. <laughs> I'm not the strongest bit. Brooke's not the strongest bit. The strongest thing that holds our marriage together the best is God. And so if I don't have him, I'm going to struggle a whole lot more. Um, but we have these weddings performed. I did a wedding once and <laughs> the problem is I love to keep it real. This is the dilemma I face. And I also like to be liked. And, but I like to stay true to God but be liked at the same time. And I have these dilemmas in life and... And so these people wanted to get married and they, they talked about that. They wanted a minister and I'm just sort of so, so, how much did, is God involved in your life? 
like, you know, and talked about how powerful and helpful it is to pray together and involve him. Um, and, and that was just something I had to talk about before they got married. They were like, oh, really? Oh, really? It was like news to them. Like, no, we just wanted to tick the box. That's our tradition. You know, my parents, you know, went to church and her parents down the track went to church. But I never really thought about actually involving God in our day-to-day life. We just wanted a nice religious ceremony. And, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's, it's not just their fault. That's our society and the way we think. We also have, uh, I remember, I was asked, and you might think I'm crazy, but that's fine. You probably already do. Someone asked, can we do a baby dedication? I go, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it at church in front of everyone that's dedicated. Oh, no, we don't want to do it at church. I'm like, well, you know, you, they've been Christians. Isn't church a good place to come and bring up your kid up in the Lord? Oh, no, we just want to do a nice ceremony. You know, my parents are this and that. And so it's like we want to do a baby dedication. Or people want to do a... Uh, my parents, um, when they went to Chris and Sarah... Because my mum had a background, uh, her, she grew up in Anglican church, she wanted a christening, so she went and spoke to the minister. And he questioned them, like, so where are you at with God? Like, do you? And they're like, oh. And he goes, well, I don't, really, I don't want to christen your baby unless <coughs> you have, a, you know, you've worked out what you want to do with the Lord. So they went home, and mum talked to dad, and dad talked to mum, and mum goes, well, I've always believed, you know. Um, and Dad goes, yeah, you know, I believe too. And in that moment, they talked and then they prayed to God and they committed their life to God and they came back and spoke to the minister. And they never wavered. They followed Jesus from that point on. And that was it. Good thing that minister spoke to them about that and maybe was a little bit offensive to them because their life totally went on a different track as they realised, oh, this is not just something we're ticking the box. This is a lifestyle that we're bringing our kids into. This isn't just some lukewarm, ticker box type of experience move on. And, you know, I've done some funerals too. And people that have, don't have, in my, and you don't know where people are at, but people like the prayers and the religious experience at the end. They want it at the start, they want it somewhere in the middle, and they want it at the end. But what about every day? Like God didn't just show up on your deathbed. He didn't just show up when you were born. He didn't just show up when you were He's like, I'll see you when you're dead. Like, God is everywhere. He's all over the place. He's available. He is God Almighty, Holy of Holies. Worthy be worshipped and praise in heaven. Uh, he's being worshipped all day long and no one's getting bored. It's just all consuming glory. And sometimes we forget that because we're living day to day in our bodies that are temporary and our stresses and things, we forget that God is still the same as he is when we are free from our bodies and free from our stresses, he is the same yesterday, today and forever. And we have this opportunity to connect with him today. When we have these religious celebrations that don't affect our day-to-day life, we have the date, 2018, we're counting from when Jesus was here. We've got this BC thing. We've got Christmas and Easter and all these things going on. And sometimes we get caught up in a moment of a religious experience and forget that actually God is still around on Monday. Hey man, I'm guilty of it too. I build up to church and I think, whoa, you know, and I start focusing on things. And I'm, I get the benefit of really studying scriptures, and learning worship songs and playing them. And the byproduct of that, even though it's for a purpose on Sunday service, is that I get refreshed, I connect with God, and I connect with His Word. But it's like, what about Monday? Well, Ray sees me on Monday at Breakfast Club. I'm walking in. (laughs) Getting the kids ready because they've had a massive weekend. Having the best time of their life. You know? Every day. And I don't think all of it is just that God is angry. Although he is capable of being angry. I mean, it's not a nice thing. I I think it's that he died for so much more than the odd experience here and there in life. I I think when Jesus said, I've come to give you life 
and a life in all of its fullness. It wasn't about two or three days in your life. I think it's about life. Today, tomorrow, the next day. I think it's about life. And while we have a mentality of ticker box mentality, having a background of a culture sort of linked with Christianity but not actually the lifestyle, we miss out on so much more of having a God that wants to be in our life day to day to day to day. You know, but I've noticed our culture is changing. It's becoming secularised. Even the ticker box experience is sort of being, there's a pushback on that. And that's sad to a degree, but it's exciting to a degree. Because in that, in this time, we have an opportunity as the church to reveal what we were always meant to be. A bride in love with Jesus, unwilling to settle for anything else. You know, I was in Russia, um, and I went to a Russian Orthodox church. Whoa, it was intense. Like, wow. Like, freaking out in that place. It was in a small village, freaking out in there. But, you know, the Russian Orthodox church was the only one allowed to exist during the era of, uh, of, of communism. It was allowed to exist. In, in China, there was a state-endorsed church that was allowed to exist. In China, there's also a secret underground church where people, if they were caught, they'd be tortured, they'd na- their nails ripped off, all sorts of things are told firm to the truth. Fastest growing church in all the world, the underground one. I don't know about you. Oh. Lord, help me in this. But I would prefer... I I, I don't want to be the church that gets the tick of approval from the government more than the one that's in love with Jesus. (laughs) Verse 17. You say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realise that you are wretched, Pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Oh, gee, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? You are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel to you, my advice to you, is that you buy from me gold refined in fire, freshly hot, so that you you can become rich, And white clothes to wear. So that you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes. So that you can see. So he's going, you've got lukewarm water. Buy from me gold. Freshly hot from the fire. So that you can, I'm truly rich. Wear some white clothes. I can see black garments everywhere. You know, that's your identity that you're based in. Wear some white clothes. The purity of a different lifestyle of following me. The the colour of a pure bride. (laughs) And salve to put on your eyes so that you can see the very, a, a reference to the very substance that was making that place famous. And so it's interesting how Jesus communicates with them. The city of Laodicea was a trade centre. So Jesus doesn't talk to them like he may to other people in different cities. He engages them in a trade talk. He says, you can purchase from me. And how did people purchase in a trade environment? They traded. So it wasn't just a monetary system, which was around then, and they had the banking system. It was a trade talk. Trade in your black garments for my white ones. Trade in to receive from me gold refined in fire. Trade in for me to get south to heal your spiritual eyes. It's like come into 
come into a trade agreement with me. A trade agreement with me and come into the light of loving me, having me in all of my fullness that I have given to you and walking a walk like that. He said, you think you're rich, but you're poor. You know, there's this great trade, the greatest uh, inequitable trade of all time was the trade that Jesus came to give himself for us. Jesus who came out of glory to come to earth to make an almighty trade, his life for our life. His kingdom for the kingdom of the world. And Jesus has said, you can't serve both God and money. You know, we talk a lot and stress a lot about money. The financial systems change a lot. Situations change a lot. I grew up in an environment at home where we were poor and then we're doing okay. And you know, at the end of the day, we're all fine. You know, and you know, and I know that we'll be fine. Yet we spend so much of the real estate of our thinking toward money and how to make the most out of it. And if our the real estate of our mind is consumed with worldly things and money just being one of them, then maybe we need to repent. Repentance means a complete change of mindset toward the kingdom of God where we're still dealing with all that we need to deal with, but it's not consuming and taking the real estate of our mind, not taking the peace that God has given us. And it says in verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So he's just abused them. Like, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. But he said, I do that because I love you. Have you ever had someone in your life where you've had to confront them and say something uncomfortable, not because you've got pleasure out of saying it, but because you know that there's the potential for the truth that you are going to share that other people won't, that it might help? Anyone ever been in that place before? <laughs> Don't you wish you didn't have to engage in that place? But you love someone so much that you just have to do it because it's not, you love them more than them being in relationship with you. You would lay down your relationship with them so that they might possibly receive life or get help. <laughs> and here Jesus is, is the definition of love. And he's looking at these people and calling them out for what he sees them as. Because he loves them. Those whom I love are discipline and rebuke. So be earnest. Come on, let's, let's be real here. Be earnest and repent. Get that metanoia going. Flick that mindset around. You're thinking this way so much you can't even see it. You're so blind. But I'm telling you, this is your blindness. See where you're heading. Get out of this lukewarm type of horrible vomit state and get fresh in me. And open your eyes to life. <laughs> Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. We, we learned about doors and knocking last week a bit. How so many times when we see the words doors and knocking in the New Testament, it's about people's hearts being opened to Christ. People's hearts being opened to the kingdom of God. Paul asked for people to pray that the doors would be open over areas. He would say, oh, I'm going over here in this place because a door has been opened. So he knows that God can open and shut doors and that we can leave the opening and the shutting of the doors to him and, and we just need to go about loving people. The doors will open and shut to the kingdom of God and people's understanding according to his great wisdom and our heart response. But he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with that person and they with me. Look, my desire, this is Jesus, my desire is to have deep, meaningful fellowship with you. 
That's why this whole issue, this whole, not issue, this whole ordinance of communion is so important to Jesus. Come with me, I want to eat with you, I want to drink with you, I want to have fellowship with you. And it's a powerful thing to, uh, uh, you have deep fellowship with anyone that you invite over and you have a meal with around a table. And Jesus is saying, I want to have a meal with you, I want to eat with you. At the moment, I'm trying to eat with you, but all I feel like doing is vomiting. But I really, really want to eat with you, so much so that I'm willing to try and swallow what I'm looking at here. But I just can't handle it. Come on, come and repent. Open your eyes. And I will come and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Isn't that nice? You know, we have the most... He is so glorious and so powerful. Yet he opens up the door, he knocks on our heart, and he's actually inviting us to sit in a place, a scary place. Right with him. To be like a little child. Be so comfortable. So deeply in fellowship with him. I'll give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. You know, Jesus prayed the prayer, didn't he? He goes, oh, I pray for the future believers, Lord, that they would be one. Just as we are one. Father, just as we are, you know. May they be one like we are. And this is a picture of how at one they are. I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. That's how deep he wants it to be with us. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church, churches. You know, eternity is... We're in the middle of eternity. And eternity has come knocking on the door of our heart. And his name is Jesus. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. Let's not get distracted by the shallowness of living for, a temp- for the temporary becoming a lover of just ourselves and our own pleasure and our own ways. You see, when we idolise ourselves and when we only live for ourselves and our whole thinking everything's about making our life better and things like that, when we stop becoming givers and people that genuinely love and open our heart to allow Jesus to help us to do that because I know naturally I'm a very selfish person and it's just a wonderful thing for Jesus' love to work through our hearts to be able to love other people. It's liberating for them and liberating for us. But when we idolise ourselves... We do limit ourselves to the temporary. We limit ourselves to a focus of the temporary. The temporary is the only realm where we have some level of control. Whatever you worship, you limit your capacity to think and be according to what you idolise and worship. And if your form is the highest form of worship to you and what we put into... All we'll be able to see and focus on because as we lift it to the highest place is our lifespan in eternity. And why do you think, when you think about it rationally it doesn't make sense, but why do you think that there's a whole bunch of humanity and I sometimes slip into this and got to get out of it, is so steadfastly focused on our lifespan that we make it to a certain age to have enough money to retire to be able to do well but we don't Our thoughts are limited. It kind of just hits the wall there. There's something about us in mankind that can't really think too much beyond our life. Our whole focus and mentality is around this short-term experience of temporariness. And that's because if our worship only goes as far as ourselves, our vision and our perspective will only go as far as we can go or have control over. I'm not the God of my life when I die. I have no option. But if we focus on God who is of eternity, of an eternal nature, then we look at our lives from a, from a more honest and real perspective. My life is here for a short amount of time and then it's gone. So what I do in this world is not all about me and not all about building my kingdom and not all about my legacy. And if I do things... and 
I'm, I'm not well received or I'm not that successful. It doesn't really matter because I'm only here for a bit. And when we lose that sense of fear of other people and we can live with that focus, fixing our eyes on Jesus, our perspective goes beyond that and we walk a life with peace. I don't know about you, but sometimes I think our focus has been even shorter than our lifespan. We can't even get that far, which really concerns me in my own self when I, if I worry about in a few years' time or a year time or six months' time or tomorrow. When I'm consumed with that, I'm thinking, what am I idolising then? What am I serving? Because whatever I'm worshipping is... The, it, it limits my perspective. But if my worship is focused on the Almighty, the beginning and the end, then what I'm facing tomorrow doesn't really matter. And if we think rationally, it doesn't matter anyway, because we're going to get through it. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our life. When Jesus faced the cross, he wasn't fixated on his lifespan. It says it was for the joy set before him that reached well beyond his human fleshly lifespan. It was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. He was able to endure it because he was serving and responding to the instructions of his father and for the joy set before him about who he was dying for. For generations, generations, generations to come. And through those generations, eternity in that life and that life and that life and that life and that life. And we can endure and we can be patient in our lifespan through many different things because for the joy set before us, our vision goes beyond that under the grace of God. So let's let's not be lukewarm. Let's not sell short what Jesus has paid for. But let's walk in peace. And and what I mean is, oh no, now I've got to be like a superstar Christian. I've got to get my stopwatch out and time how long I'm going to pray for or how long I'm going to read my Bible for. And if I didn't do that yesterday, I'll fill my head up with how insufficient I was the day before. That's not what it's about. There's something incredibly beautiful that I'm learning. I'm learning now. This is what I'm in the phase right now. Of not over-assessing how I'm going. But understanding that God has graciously granted favour on me so that I can't lose in life. And if I wasn't that great yesterday or this morning, I can't lose because I have, I'm a gracious I've been, I'm a recipient of incredible grace. I'm a recipient. I'm a favoured one. I'm, a, I'm God's kid. So I can make mistakes, but I can't lose. I might stumble, but I can't lose and I can't fail because my mind is, in a, is constantly in the process of repenting, letting go of a worldly way of thinking in a hierarchy and a ladder and a thing to climb up and re- getting refreshed to go into a lifestyle of peace and absolute security. You know, Jesus wants us to feel absolutely secure in him. Absolutely secure. Jesus does... Let, oh, you need to remember this. Tomorrow, the next day, whatever. Jesus does not want you to feel insecure about what he has done for you. He does not want you to feel insecure about it at all. Even if you did this, he does not want you to feel insecure. He wants you to be like a little child... When the prodigal son came back to his father, it wasn't a list of things that he needed to get restored and fixed and go through a program to prove himself again. All that he needed to do was come home. So if you weren't that great a few minutes ago, come home in your heart. And as you start trying to rattle off your excuses to the father, he he doesn't really want to hear it. He just wants you to come home and he wants to fellowship with you. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to eat with you. He wants your heart. Jesus was always about people's hearts. The woman in the well arguing about where we should worship. And she's like, can you stop with that? Like, you, you, 
you, you've had five husbands because you're living with somebody husband. Oh, getting a bit close to the bone there. Yeah, that's right, because I'm not interested in the stuff. I'm interested in your heart. And let's, we can move on from there. He wasn't even intimidated by her life situation. He just wanted to come in that moment and move on from there. A woman caught in the act of adultery. He wasn't over-sessing the crime. He was drawing her in and said, yeah, okay, that's cool. Come to me. Go and sin no more. Move on. Move on, move on. And that's how we can stay hot with God. By opening our heart as he knocks on the door of our heart to go, okay, okay, okay. I'll let you have your way in me. Your strength, not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Got some notes there for men, Lee? Yeah. Wow. I will be very interested to find out what I said today. That would be great. The men's group is on this week on Thursday. <laughs>